My name is Christine O'Krent. I'm delighted to introduce this uh, panel. Uh, the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Lithuania, Mr. Linkevicius. Nico Popescu, he is an analyst who is about to join us and we're delighted. He specializes on Russia and the Russian world. And Mr. Svoboda, who I understand is from Austria, but uh, who was with the European Parliament. Uh, let me just remind you of a few facts. Three Ukrainian soldiers were killed last weekend in the east of Ukraine. Last week, uh, the official investigation about the MH17 flight, uh, where 289 people, if my memory is correct, were killed, mostly of them Dutch, that official investigation confirmed the suspicion that it was indeed a Russian operation. And uh, on May 19th, which was the anniversary of the annexion of Crimea, President Putin, who by the way, in the press conference with President Macron in St. Petersburg, said the play, what play? In any case, on the anniversary of the annexion of Crimea, he inaugurated that new bridge, the bridge, between Crimea and Russia. Uh, as we all know, uh, European sanctions uh, were uh, prolongated last March, every six months, uh, on a unanimity basis. The 28 countries uh, have to decide whether to actually go on with these sanctions. We know there have always been three countries, uh, much more skeptical, but which so far uh, voted to maintain these sanctions, Greece, Cyprus, and Italy. Uh, it's, uh, we're very sorry indeed that Mr. Di Stefano, who is the spokesman for foreign affairs for Cinque Stelle in Italy, couldn't be with us for obvious uh, domestic reasons. Uh, we all noticed, and it was very interesting, in the contract between uh, the Liga del Norte and uh, the Five Stars Movement, the most precise paragraph of that contract was about Russia, is about Russia, and the need indeed to resume normal relations with that key partner. So I hope, Nico, in particular, that you will help me uh, expose some of these arguments uh, which have to be taken into account, whatever happens actually in, in Italy. So let me start with you, Mr. Minister. In your view, uh, should the EU maintain and maybe reinforce such sanctions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's really interesting to discuss after Western Balkans in another direction. But still, still, so to say, in my mind, it was totally Mikhail that, you know, it's been made difference that we have European perspective to Western Balkans. It's not the case for Eastern partners. I don't like this uh, dual approach and uh, this uh, dual standards. Everywhere, double standards, basically, persisting. And here, when we're talking about sanctions, first of all, I have to say, nobody can be proud about language of sanctions. It's not the way people should talk, countries should talk, but it's like last resort, we applying when some other side is not listening, not making any, any so to say, changes in the policy. And here in the case, so we discussed long, we, we had some also priorities defined, we also had some, some so to say, benchmarks uh, fixed, uh, and uh, our, our, our so position is quite clear. There are some comments from some capitals, as you said, some skepticism maybe, doubts about whether sanctions working or not, but we all, and we are coming to the point to, to agree, we always uh, agreeing, and I hope it will be the case. I hope it will be the case. It's a bit the uh, Italians not here. Uh, I don't know about future future government, maybe a future government would be formed by the forces, which were uh, very outspoken during the electoral campaign against sanctions, that would be a big problem, but it uh, looks like not the case. And I hope we'll keep, uh, we'll keep the same, uh, so to say, stance. 
Uh, I also like to say that we have five principles agreed among European Union ministers in the relations with Russia. Sanctions is just one of, one of them. And as I said, I believe we have to keep them. Uh, the title of discussion a bit provocative. What beyond? So beyond, I would see. Uh, of course, if no sanctions, uh, it's possible. If uh, Russia will change policy and uh, try try to, so to say, comply with the demands and commitments of herself, or or beyond sanctions could be more sanctions, which is also uh, in theory agreed. But you know how it's uh, not not easy to, to, to make. Recently, we had a very interesting forum, Russian forum. In not far from Vilnius, uh, where uh, position representatives of Russia came and they all were saying that sanctions are important, but guys, you're targeting, so to say, wrong, wrong way. You are missing the targets because many, many um, sanctions you applied uh, are, are really against those who have much, not much to do with decision-making process. And you want to make them efficient, of course, it could be, it's possible, but it should be done in some different way. In other words, sanctions just one of the principles we, we agree and relations with that country. It also has to do with resilience, which we need to do more, not only in the eastern part, but also in the western part of Europe. This is uh, definitely the case. We have to support the eastern partners. I mentioned already why it's important, because they also made the choice. They also made the choice. And five out of six eastern partners, they have frozen or active conflicts in the territory. So this is also price of the choice, and it's also test of our reliability as a partners because uh, values, what they are defended, it's not just their problem, it should be, should be also our, our problem. Selective engagement was one of the principles. In my view, uh, this engagement was not, with not, not much selection going on. Uh, and uh, coming to the support of civil society, which in my view, it's really very, not, not, not systematic, just rather ad, ad hoc. And we are not talking to people which deserved to be talked to. And frankly, Russia is a big country, and time to distinguish Russia and Kremlin, because uh, those who were representing their country in the forum I mentioned, they are also Russians. And when we talk in Russian about future of Russia uh, together uh, with them, uh, about future of democratic Russia and the free world, uh, so also dialogue with Russia, I would argue. But it's not perceived like that in, 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 in many many corners of, of my. My Sotsi colleagues. So, uh, in brief, uh, I believe we must keep sanctions as they are. If not works, we have to add them, uh, definitely, because uh, choosing uh, your political targets, and that, that should be our policy. Mr. Svoboda, would you subscribe to that, to those arguments? Well, first of all, it's the wrong question, because the real question is what to do about Russia from the Soviet European Union. When there was a European Parliament that supported the sanctions, and there is no reason why now to lift them. So insofar, and I, I agree, but we have to see that things are changing. It's not only the government mentioned, we have uh, some East European government, the government of my country, which is not my government, but my country, uh, may also change its position. This is the one element. The other element is, of course, to find a solu well, solution to have a uh, some steps forward in the Ukraine situation. In the Ukraine, every day, people are killed. A couple of three uh, people per day. And if you speak with Ukraine, it was recently again in, in, in Ukraine, uh, who want to go from one part to the other country, uh, or who go for, for the Crimea, for example, uh, to Ukraine proper in that sense, they have a lot of difficulties. They need one day, and they have to pay money, <laughs> and as uh, some people told me, more money to the Ukrainian authorities, black, uh, well, black money of course, than to the Russian authorities. So it's not, uh, you know, a black and white history. And I see we should be very strong on, on the Russian side, but we should be very strong also on the Ukrainian side. Of course. Because, yeah, but we are not. We are not. They, on the fight against corruption, many other things, what they do, are not in appliance or in compliance with European values. We always speak about values, but uh, in, in some um, countries we say, okay, you violate values, in other not. By the way, I could be provocative and say we did not, uh, for example, uh, speak about sanctions against the US when they violated uh, international law and went into Iraq. So we are a bit one-sided. This is Iraq. One, Iraq. This, this, this is the one element. 
The second element, of course, what we really should do, and put pressure, for example, on the Ukrainian side, is how to prepare the conditions for a UN force in, in the area. It's not an easy issue, but we have to do something in that direction, uh, because it's absolutely necessary to stop the killing first. So the, the, the major question is not sanctions yes or no, sanctions are here and cannot be lifted for a moment, of course, but the main question is how to stop the killing in uh, Ukraine and how to promote some, you know, real push more between Russia and Ukraine and whatever can be done in that area. Secondly, the general attitude of Russia. We just heard it just only can, I'm not a, a fan of Vladimir Putin, but it's absolutely right. We are surprised about Russia and <coughs> Turkey's influence in the Balkans, but we don't have a strategy to, to combat it. And with all respect, economic uh, integration is a good thing, but the real thing is about security anxieties also in Europe. Why, why don't we elaborate something of, let's say, a EU Balkan security union where we promote security issues in order to counter Russia's activities there? That's what NATO is supposed to do. No, but I don't speak about military security, but I speak about, um, about uh, terrorism, about smuggling of drugs. We, we perfectly know that drugs are coming and, and weapons are coming via from, partly from Latin America, where Africa, uh, to the Balkans and the European Union. So it's only one of the examples. And the last point, we have to deal with Russia on some certain issues. Syria, for example. Will it be that Syria is uh, determining the political situation, uh, Russia is determining the political situation, and you is paying afterwards, as in most of the cases? So again, in, on Iran, also on the question of Iran-Israel, because it's European interest to prevent a war between the two, the only power at the moment who can do something about it is Russia again. So, uh, and as the minister said, we not agree with it, me, but. As the minister said, Russia and, and the Kremlin is not the same, but for the moment, the Kremlin is, is leading. So my answer is, don't concentrate on the sanctions. Yes, they are here. I am absolutely against enlarging it. But try to find ways how to deal with Russia in times also of sanctions. And the reason that, because I think Doug Bill mentioned yesterday, Belarus, it was uh, some days ago in Belarus, there are many countries around who are ready to a helping hand, so to say, or who, with whom we should step up uh, relations in order to have a dialogue. The same is true, of course, of Moldavia and Armenia and others. So, yes, sanctions should not be lifted now because there is no uh, way how to, to, to convince why we should, but we should change our policy towards Russia in making some offers where we can cooperate uh, and, of course, prepare. Uh, UN troop uh, for the eastern Ukraine in order to stop the killing. That's the most important thing. Just one question, because you mentioned quite rightly and fortunately that uh, Ukraine is not exactly uh, what we had all hoped it would become. So, in your view, what should uh, the EU do in order to uh, compel President Poroshenko to be? more active, shall we say, in terms of uh, fighting against corruption, not putting all his cronies uh, in the relevant jobs, and all that goes with it. I think there was a, some of the financial support, maybe, you know, some of the oligarchs don't need the EU money, but the financial support should be all, all, all conditional on going really fighting corruption. There are some legislation that has been done, I don't say nothing has been done, but not enough. And especially concerning the eastern Ukraine, uh, the corruption which is affecting ordinary citizens. And for example, to improve the situation. That's not new, I'm sorry to say. Yeah, I mean, it's not new, but the EU is not doing anything really strong on that. Because if people want to go from the east to get their pension or come from the Crimea to get their pension, uh, first, they have to pay a lot of money, also the Ukrainian authorities, not only the Russian, yeah, all okay. the Ukrainian okay. authorities, and that is not acceptable. And we are more or less blind on this spot. Uh, Nico Popescu, let's uh, touch upon another issue where uh, the attitude of some key European countries is indeed more than ambiguous, and that has to do with energy and gas. 
uh, we have seen that the European Commission is willing to make a compromise with Gazprom, uh, not uh, ask Gazprom to pay a huge fine for not behaving properly, uh, particularly towards Ukraine. Uh, and we also see uh, Madame Merkel, uh, of course, uh, insisting upon uh, the importance of Nord Stream 2. Uh, but also, I think, uh, lately, she said that, of course, uh, in that particular uh, case, Gazprom had to behave and pay uh, some dues to Ukraine. So, to what extent does uh, energy, in a way, pollute uh, the European attitude and its sanctions uh, when it comes to pursuing with the same policy. Um, yes, that's you know. So that's one of the episodes, and that's an important one. Um, but I think besides the kind of we've been constantly worried about the energy sector, but actually the truth is that we're doing so much better than we were doing a decade ago. Um, both the European Union uh, and Ukraine. Ukraine is not importing any gas from Russia these days. And that was something completely unimaginable. Just seven, eight years ago, it was the biggest importer of Russian gas in the world. Uh, so there, there are some hidden success stories and on the EU side. Now, you know, what is happening between the Commission and Gazprom, we have yet to see, but I think part of the logic of the Commission is to solve the problem rather than to slap hard and if that solves the problem, I think, you know, the kind of strategic concerns are there without the kind of good symbolic behind it. Behind it. Um, now, on the kind of broader sanctions bit, I think it's always useful when we talk about the strategy on Russia and the approach to Russia is not to zoom in narrowly on sanctions. Sanctions is one kind of foreign policy instrument. Uh, statements are another kind of policy instruments. You know, I don't imagine having in the governmental program of any government saying, you know, European statements of concern don't work. We should abolish European statements of concern uh, as a kind of diplomatic tool of influence. And the truth is that sanctions is something of a middle way between, you know, basically bombing as one continuum of foreign policy making and statements of praise and concern at the other end. And actually, if you look at sanctions as like the middle ground between military action and statements of concern and a couple of diplomatic visits, I would see sanctions as a pretty cheap foreign policy tool. Yes, it hurts businesses sometimes, but it's actually much cheaper than going to war, than doing nation building, and than doing many other things which cost us much more. Uh, now, if you kind of develop a little bit this thinking, and I think part of this discussion, it's really good to talk about what are we going to do on Russia, but it's also good to kind of passe en revue to to know what is the bill so far of our sanctions policy on Russia. And I think it's been a pretty cheap way to achieve a number of uh, European strategic goals. I think because of the sanctions, the war zone in Ukraine is smaller than it would have been. The degree of Russian open mili military intervention has been kept within the kind of hybrid confines rather than an open intervention. And that allowed also the Ukrainians to resist better that intrusion. No, if you look at Russian military spending, Russian military spending from this year is starts to go slowly down. Uh, and, you know, it's not just because of the sanctions, it's partly because they exhausted, you know, uh, this phase of military rearmament. But, of course, the sanctions are not making it more comfortable for them to keep spending a lot of defense. And that is also saving money to Europeans, because we all push for the 2%, but if the Russians would be keeping this crazy defense spending uh, you know, dynamic for the next 10 years, it would have also cost the Europeans much more on defense spending, for example. So there are multiple ways with, in which sanctions not just cost European businesses, but, you know, indirectly have ripple on effects in, in uh, saving sometimes both also money and not just strategic uh, headaches uh, for, uh, for the Europeans. I know, just one, if you want small element, the Russians have drastically downside spending for the Navy development in the next phase of military acquisition. So we're all now very scared and impressed by the Syrian, uh, Russian Syrian intervention and the Russian capacity to do expeditionary warfare. But if you look at their next phase of military spending, they don't want to spend more on the Navy, which is a key element of expeditionary warfare, which suggests probably they want to keep st sticking to kind of uh, warfare along their borders as contingency plans. But 
you know, there are implications. And some of that comes from the fact that sanctions are not giving them a lot of uh, uh, wriggle room to spend, you know, uh, on, on all the directions of defense spending. Now back to energy. I think, you know, there's a, there's a major erosion of solidarity inside the European Union. Uh, it's also the Italian government and, you know, the Hungarian, and we've known that, and there's more governments that are on an explicit anti sanction platform. There's a transatlantic erosion of solidarity behind sanctions, partly because the Americans are upping the sanctions policy, partly because the Russians did some things in the United States to which the United States have to, uh, have to respond. And not but only it, in the United States. And not only the United States, except that the United States decided to respond to sanctions and France uh, decided to respond, respond in other ways for now. But if you want, you kind of one of the best explanation as to how the sanctions policy has survived so far was given by Viktor Orban, who said that sanctions, I think, is a stupid policy, but I have bigger issues to solve in Brussels and Berlin than sanctions. And that's a kind of nuclear, it's like a nuclear weapon that I would never like to use. And I think that will continue to keep you know, a lot of pressure on the states of Europe not to go for a kind of collapsing abandonment of sanctions. Even if I go for the worst case scenarios in Italy and the finance minister, right, if they are really discussing a suspension, kind of, you know, some moves around the withdrawal from the Eurozone, do they really want to launch another war against the rest of the EU on, on, because of Russia's sanctions? I don't know. But, you know, even with worst case scenarios, the, the Russia sanctions is probably not the highest priority that, uh, that even governments who oppose it have. I'd like to insist on Italy, because yeah. it has been a consistent uh, dimension of the uh, dialogue, both of Salvini and Di Maio, separately, and even more so when they decided on this rather baroque marriage of theirs. Now, at this stage, we don't know whether uh, the marriage will actually uh, continue, uh, and Salvini may go back and Indeed, it's amazing that Berlusconi is the referee. It depends very much, as I understand it, on Berlusconi now. Uh, but uh, as far as Italy is concerned, energy, again, is a factor, isn't it? Yes, look, I, I think on this, a lot of eggs that tend to be thrown into Italy sometimes. But I think, you know, when Renzi said that there's a big difference between you depriving us of Nord Stream, you meaning Europe and specifically Berlin, uh, you deprived us of South Stream and you continue to do Nord Stream. You know, there's a fair point in it. Either, so whatever you think about the sanctions policy, it's also hard to argue against this Italian punchline in the way they feel somewhat, uh, you know, double standardized uh, by, by the way these two pipelines have been handled uh, by, by the rest of the EU. Now, if you allow me on, on the Russia strategy, and I think, you know, it's great to have engagement with Russia and the strategy. And the problem is that the Europeans have been offering them exit high, highways from the sanctions bit uh, almost every year. The five principles, one of them is selective engagement. The whole point of the five principles was to give the Russians this open door into selective engagement. So they basically were not interested. Syria. It started with a UN speech, UN General Assembly speech by Putin, who said, you know, let's build an anti-terrorist alliance and fight together ISIS and other bad guys. And when they go into Syria, they don't fight ISIS. 90% of the strikes are not against ISIS, and they are recognizing it. And, you know, in, on the 5th of February this year, the Russian, you know, military contractors are attacking U.S. troops. And uh, in April, the Russian ambassador to Lebanon on the Hezbollah channel says that he will strike American and French, you know, uh, boats who will launch missiles into Syria. So, you know, it was very but it Not only hasn't it happened, but of course, uh, when uh, the US, France, uh, and France struck uh, in Syria, there was, of course, a tacit agreement, same with Israel. There was a, a tacit agreement, or even a vocal agreement, uh, with uh, the Kremlin that, um, okay, 
Yeah, but that is not the engagement. We, we it's acceptance. We yeah. accepted what Russia does in Syria, and the Russians accepted what we do once in a while in Syria if we don't do too much. And that even applies to Israel a little bit. But the kind of bottom line of the Syria thing is that some, at some point, through the Syria operations, the Russians decided that they actually don't care about this whole kind of using Syria as a way to reset relations and what they are getting out of that military campaign is better than using Syria to reset relations on a <coughs> counter-terrorist platform with the rest of the EU. This is a decision at some point for the operation that they probably took. Uh, but, and their kind of feeling about sanctions is that, you know, they want the removal of sanctions, but they don't want to do almost anything about, you know, moving towards uh, a relaxation of them, partly because they feel that they will either collapse and they've been in waiting mode for Brexit, for Trump. So for a long time we've been waiting that the sanctions edifice will collapse anyway without them making concessions. And that is why, you know, none of the exits from the sanctions highway, if you want, have been taken. And they also have a key role to play in this policy of not trying to move beyond what is today's uh, very sanction-centric policy. Uh, Mr. Likivicius, uh, there's another row of sanctions which indeed uh, President Trump would very much like the European to join. Uh, I believe there's even an American delegation touring uh, European capitals this very week. Uh, sanctions which have been applied by the US uh, against a few key oligarchs uh, for Russian interference, uh, cyber attacks, and so on and so forth. The irony, of course, is that these American sanctions are backlashing against economic interests uh, in Europe, uh, particularly uh, as far as aluminum, for instance, is concerned. Would you subscribe to uh, the American uh, demand that indeed uh, Europe joins into that new salvo of sanctions, which have nothing to do with Ukraine. Well, many questions at the same time. So first of all, we have to coordinate policy with Americans. It was done during previous administration, and that, that was working. When we are talking about economic sanctions, individual sanctions, although I would repeat, we really sometimes are very often miss, missing the target. And uh, Carl left the room, but I remember when we were discussing in Foreign Affairs Council at the very beginning when we discussed sanctions in principle, it was not possible to convince colleagues to, colleagues to put somebody uh, on the list who is dealing with propaganda, for instance, like propaganda machine. It was not possible simply to do because there was no agreement, there was no understanding. Now, when we're talking about oligarchs, a very big move, I hope, in the United Kingdom, because the United Kingdom hosting really uh, many oligarchs, and you know this London we have been called, called London, London Grad, and which is not a reason, good reason for that. It's really true, So, uh, but it should be done really by, by legal institutions, not by politicians, and it's be, being done. So it should be done worldwide, basically, because uh, the leadership in Kremlin, they have the surroundings, and uh, uh, they are feeded basically by oil and gas business, basically, in, in general. So everything that has to do with that, it's really strengthening uh, their positions, and uh, it will uh, try, try to trace the source of that power is definitely has to do with the, with the oligarchs. So in general, I, I would agree that we should think about that. It's not should be, shouldn't be done automatically. But let me come briefly to what was said about our new policy with Russia engagement. I, I would disagree when we, was, when we are talking about improvement of relations, that we have to improve relations. We, we have to do something. We have to change policy. We didn't, you know, uh, occupy 20% of Georgian territory. We didn't annex Crimea, we didn't uh, conduct aggression in eastern Ukraine, we didn't meddle in the political system of foreign countries or elections or, or so to say, referendums. Uh, we didn't, uh, so to say, take part in, in the preparations of coup in Montenegro. What we should improve? What, what we should do in different? Uh, it will retreat, it will uh, take it as a new normal. That would be a big mistake, basically. In Russia, we do not have partnership these days. This is not a partner. This is, this is uh, something we should take into account, uh, waste some resources, time, uh, but if they will do something uh, uh, along the lines of our uh, policies, uh, let's say in the, in the regions or the 
problems we, 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 we can address together, they will do just because of their own interests, not because to please us or to, to, to be nice. So we have to understand that this is really very important that you have uh, deal with somebody who is in the field of uh, uh, level playing field, but uh, rules are different. And if you're playing soccer, so other side playing rugby at the same time. And score is a bit different, so this should be also understood. I'm not, play, I'm not asking for unfair play, no. I'm just asking to take into account that this is the case. And uh, this is time to realize when we're talking uh, about relations with this country. And again, coming back to sanctions, of course it's not just about sanctions. But it's the only leverage we're using. If we would have menu of uh, measures, sanctions, isolation, I don't know, something else, we can choose, but nothing else is done. Isolation also not applied. Isolation doesn't mean to cut, to cut all uh, contacts, it's not about that. It's about uh, high-level meetings, sometimes our leaders queuing to go to Kremlin and just fixing the points with a little or no outcome, that like, like to say. What we're doing, legitimizing, so to say, their imagination as a center of gravity and trying to prove that nothing in the world can be solved without them and if somebody needs, they will come and uh, they will, so to say, ask. And they are coming not just to Moscow, but to St. Petersburg, to Sochi, everywhere. And they are selling that to their own public as a major player in the world. This is also the case of isolation, not applied at all. Only sanctions left, and also, as I said, very limited, and not sometimes even not to the target. So when we're discussing these issues, let's take into account all scope of the problems. At this stage, I suggest uh, the floor takes over and asks questions. Carl, please. May I react? Because I've been criticized. Or may I cannot answer the name. question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Maybe you, you can. Uh, I'm yeah. sure there will be many answers well, on your no argument. To the COVID, many so. questions. So, Carl, please go ahead. Not a car, yes, but I would like to be like Carl. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but you know the light is set, sure. same height and almost the same attire. I was <laughs> this was until October last year. Sorry, I, I apologize. I don't know either to you or to him. That's okay. We are twin brothers anyway, like-minded. Uh, no, until October last year, I was EU ambassador to Russia, so I went through all the through all the you know bottlenecks uh, since 2013. I mean, I want to get back to Kadri's audit, uh, which is uh, empirical uh, proof that there is a fatigue within the EU in terms of policies within Russia. And that's very dangerous. If we don't demonstrate, demonstrate staying power, if we start you know, dragging the feet, if we get back into the illusions that we can change Russia, and more than half of the EU member states, according to the audit, uh, would like to engage with Russia in order to influence Russia. This is, I mean, illusion. Uh, President Putin uh, is a hostage of his own system, which he has created, uh, kleptocracy. And for him, it's about how to disrupt and discredit liberal order. What yesterday Timothy Ashton was, was talking in all of us, it's about uh, to defend Russian Orthodox state, uh, not to allow any meddling. And last not least, he will never give up on Ukraine. He'll never give so for us, what is important coming back is to have uh, a pragmatic but principled approach of EU strategy. And I would like to, to hear from, from the colleagues on the, on, on the panel, what is the strategy? What should we engage for? What are the tangibles we can achieve by using this selective engagement while maintaining principal support for Ukraine and defending our own liberal order? Thank you. Mr. Svoboda. Yeah, just to give an, uh, try to give an also an answer here and also to the colleagues. First of all, I think the worst would be if we have a change in the attitude and, and, and uh, sections break down just chaotically. Uh, but it's not only the energy question. The energy question is for the official side, but it's also for the ordinary citizens who are a bit fed up about the hypocrisy that on the West it's always moral rights and rule of law which is not always the case. No, and but it's more so the case than yeah, but not the, the East, yeah, but let's put it politely. If I can develop my argument. No, no, but please on go the, ahead. But, but on the Russian side, it's always the bad thing. Uh, and if you look to Syria, I can also imagine that some of the support uh, of the West for some of the very, very radical Islamistic terrorist groups 
has also been uh, not, not a good thing. So that's the one element. Um, second, so, second thing, Russia should be our strategic partner, was always our mantra. It is not, it cannot be. I fully agree with the minister, it's not our partner. It's a competitor. We have to see it as a competitor. The EU and NATO, and it's good so, enlarged in the past, uh, about since the breakdown of the Soviet Union, more and more and more. It was with the will of the people, it was support, and it, I fully agree with it. But if you see it from geopolitics of Russia, it was all the rest is extending and I'm shrinking. So this is part of the psychological background of the reaction of Putin that we have to recognize. Third, and the last point specific to your question. You know, as was just mentioned on, on the Balkans, why not have a stronger alliance with those countries who are the potential victims of Russian influence? In the Balkans, of course, in Georgia, Moldavia, so we did also good things, for example in Moldavia, to find a solution, or in Armenia. But I want to remember, the first reaction when Romania, Armenia said, we are not going to sign the, the, the treaty with the EU, was, okay, leave where you are. Second thought was, fortunately, to say, okay, we have to do it with, with Armenia, also some agreement, even if Armenia is joining the Eurasian uh, Economic Union, which Oh, I would, uh, uh, would advise, why not go into political discussion between the EU and the Eurasian Economic Union? We always thought, oh, they will disappear, nothing, nothing will happen. Putin will not be successful in creating it. He was successful. It's an arrogance of the West, and I, I do it a bit more provocative, but the arrogance of the West to think we have, are the only one who can dominate on this part of the Eurasian continent. We cannot. We have to recognize that we cannot. It's not a moral question to accept what Putin is doing, not at all, but to find a way to have more partners, including also Belarus. Finally, we do something more with Belarus. We need more partners who are potential victims also of Russian influence. That's the only way we can, you know, put Russia to a limit. Let's go back to the floor. Yes. Questions were asked. Can, can I ask, answer the question later? Uh, later, if you don't mind, because uh, I'm trying to catch up uh, after Vasena, so uh, my task Katarina. is very difficult. Go ahead, and then we... Katarina, Katarina go ahead, and maybe the minister can the answer on the European Commission responsible topics. for Eastern uh, Partnership uh, countries. Uh, in, at the Brussels Forum, I was on a panel with Kurt Walker, who said one thing I would like to quote here, and goes along the lines that Nico mentioned. Uh, Russia will leave Donbas when it's going to be too expensive for them to stay there, one way or another. So that's just another way to say that yes, the sanctions have had uh, a very concrete, uh, very concrete result. But what I would like to say is to the other side of the uh, title, which is Ukraine, where I strongly have to push back against uh, uh, what was said on the panel and 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 echoed by the by the moderator. The one war we didn't talk about, we talked about the hot war, is the disinformation war that Russia has been waging uh, very, very successfully. And unfortunately, they have succeeded in framing the Western narrative on Ukraine. I cannot disagree more that Ukraine has not done anything about corruption. I cannot disagree more. Sure, there is huge room to continue. Sure, we have people are not behind bars, but that takes years to develop institutions. But what they have done, and I will quote three figures, this is a country that has, and this is saying it in France, that has gone five times, five and a half times down in budget deficit from over 10% to 1.4% last year. It has decreased public expenditure as part of GDP from 53 to 40%. A, a fraction of that would be a dream for the president in this country, and we it's not better. Thank you. It, sorry. Uh, and it's uh, it's not due to efficiency gains. It's due to limiting corruption in key sectors: gas, manipulating uh, exchange fixed exchange rate, public procurement, VAT refunds. 
you name it. There is a number of areas where they closed corruption, and the best figure to illustrate it is that two years ago, Naftogaz, the gas monopoly, had $8 billion loss. Last year, it had $1 billion profit. The delta of $9 billion does not come from good management and efficiency gains. So please, let's not continue you know, pushing the Russian narrative that Ukraine is so corrupt it's practically a failed state because this is a Russian narrative and we are falling for it and I think it's really time to stop doing that. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you. Mr. Minister, will you subscribe to this uh, positive assessment? No, it's not just positive, it's also also just a sober assessment what I really subscribe. Uh, I'd like to say even more, uh, also supporting you when you said that we are uh, really uh, should, should take very seriously uh, everything what is not going uh, right in Ukraine. And definitely, uh, when I'm going to Ukraine, I'm always seeing uh, enemy from outside, Russia, aggressor, but uh, en enemy number two, or, or maybe equal, is corruption, it's your own, so to say, it's grown in Ukraine. And you cannot blame anyone, basically. But at the same time, let me remind, they are in the status of war, they are fighting in the front line. They, they have soldiers being killed and, and the, the war is conducted from outside, aggression from outside. It's not civil war in Ukraine. And I'm not saying that we should lower uh, level of requirements. Of course not, and they know that. When, when we are going, in, when I'm going to, to Kiev, and also going, not to Kiev, I'm also going to the front line, also meeting people who are really different. They have their identity. They have a really strong civil society. They really have a choice, a European choice. And at the same time, they are frustrated, angry on own government because of bureaucracy and corruption, and also frustrated with regard to, with regard to the European, so to say, behavior. When I was in Avdiyevka recently, standing by the destroyed house and talking to old old woman who said, I I'm going to die here. I will not move from here because nobody cares about my wife. N nobody interested. I said, lady, maybe you can move somewhere else and the house will be repaired. No, no, I'll, I'll die here. And that was really said by, by a woman who, in 21st century, living in Europe and uh, cannot, cannot so to say, survive. But very briefly on people, uh, yeah, what strategy? we have to do. Briefly, but of course it should be more long, so to say, talk. But it will be, I, I will brief. First of all, we have to respect our own decisions, which was not done in 2008 after war in some caucuses, after, after demands were issued, after we told what Russia must do, what we expect Russia to do. Nothing was done, literally nothing. And we came back to business as usual because all calls for pragmatism and need to cooperate were stronger. We also should support our policies, energy union principles. The third package, uh, not seen too, by the way, not in line with this thinking, but it's still ahead. And by the way, punishing Ukraine politically. Is it, is it right approach? I believe not quite right approach. We have to support, uh, also support, uh, conditional support to Ukraine. And there are some uh, plans and programs how to provide assistance. It's not about additional money because we, they have limited absorption capacity, basically. We have to help them to make the process more transparent, maybe with our participation, maybe with the commission participation. But there, there are ideas in inviting the and the EIB to make sure that we are really not impartial. They are partial here because we would like to see success in that country. And resilience very much agree. We just started. We discussed some time ago. It was not so easy to establish cell in external action service. It's uh, maybe one million budget, something like that. But you have hundreds of millions of euros or dollars from other side for brainwashing machine. And we are losing this war, although we are capable to win. So in brief, what we can do, this, is, this could be the answer. Thank you.